joining us to talk about bottom line hardwoods. Um, as Dakota mentioned, uh, my name is Nick B. Miller. I'm the Southeast Region Director for the Forest Stewards Guild. Um, I'm going to be talking to you today um, about, um, you know, kind of a 10,000 foot view of the, uh, the Guild's um, Southeast program, kind of who we are as an organization, and some of the work we're doing around uh, bottomland hardwood forests and wildlife forestry. Um, so to give you a little context, um, I've got a background in forestry, um, bachelor's and master's in forestry, and these days <clears throat> I manage the Guild Southeast program uh, based out of Asheville, North Carolina. So happy to be with you all today. So for those of you who are not familiar with us, um, the Guild is a national nonprofit organization. Our mission is to practice and promote responsible forestry as a means for sustaining the integrity of forest ecosystems and also um, human communities dependent upon them. So really taking a balanced perspective of the social, ecological, and economic um, factors that relate to our forests, um, broadly promoting forest stewardship, uh, more specifically promoting um, ecological forestry. And so we do that in a variety of different means, um, including education, training, policy analysis, research, to some degree advocacy, and increasingly more boots on the ground action, really working on a regional level to um, work with partners to implement meaningful conservation projects um, in the different places where we work, where we work across the country. Um, our national office is in Santa Fe, New Mexico, but we have field offices around the country, um, including the Northwest, the Lake States, um, the Intermountain West, Northeast, and like I said, I manage our Southeast program uh, based out of North Carolina. We're somewhat of a unique organization in that we both have a, uh, we both have program staff that work around the country in different regional offices to help achieve the Guild's mission but we also have a membership program, of both professional members um, and, and uh, affiliate members who, um, who help achieve our mission and the work they do as well. And so as a member of the Forest Stewards Guild, you adopt a series of guiding forest stewardship principles that help um, shape your approach to forest management. Um, perhaps the most important of those principles is what we call the first duty principle which states that your first duty um, as a forester or as a forest landowner is to forest and their future. So we like to think that we hold the profession of forestry to a very high uh, stewardship ethic or standard. And so some of the work we're doing in the Southeast uh, includes some of the, um, these major kind of programmatic focal areas. So over the past several years, we've been working um, to connect um, sustainable biomass sourcing and sustainable supply chains more broadly to positive conservation impact. Um, and that has occurred in a variety of different ways. Um, we've been working in Western North Carolina on some collaborative forest restoration projects. Um, a large part of that work has um, developed into trying to connect more private landowners with resources to control invasive plants in the context of timber harvesting and um, doing forest management. Um, we've been working on shortleaf pine ecosystem restoration, um, a lot of that on the Cumberland Plateau of Tennessee and Kentucky, um, and a lot of that revolving around trying to increase regional capacity for prescribed fire. Um, and then lastly, we've been uh, working for the past several years to help define and disseminate a model of ecological forestry for bottomland hardwood forests um, across really the U.S. South. And so that's really the theme of today's um, conversation. And so we've always had a presence as an organization in the Southeast, but that's really grown a lot uh, over the past few years. And so I just want to give you kind of a sense of our bottomland hardwood program and some of the different activities and deliverables um, that have kind of brought us to where we are today. So it's been kind of a long arc to um, help move the needle and really elevate the standard of management um, for bottomland hardwoods um, across the region. Um, some of this started back in 2012 um, when the Guild produced a report on forest biomass retention and harvesting guidelines, um, which was in part 
a response um, to some concerns among some groups around the increased biomass market and some of that um, potential impact on bottomland hardwood ecosystems. Um, that developed then into us preparing a report in 2016, um, really helping highlight and synthesize um, ecological forestry approaches for bottomland hardwood forests. Um, since that time, we've involved in a, we've been involved in a few different collaborative groups, um, both working closely with industry, um, other conservation organizations, um, and public entities to um, kind of help disseminate and promote. Um, good conservation-based forestry in bottomland hardwood forests. Um, and then that's led to really now more of a focus on education and outreach and um, kind of um, exporting practices and trying to disseminate information to a wider audience. And um, that, you know, um, led to an event that we did, a learning exchange in Georgia a couple of years ago, where we brought together scientists and practitioners from across the South to share information about bottomland hardwood um, management, both in the classroom and also in the field. And so we hosted a very similar event in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, um, this past fall um, on kind of a similar theme. And so what, you know, what does it mean when we say kind of ecological forestry? Um, you know, to many practitioners, people um, work in boots on the ground every day. Ecological forestry is really synonymous with just good forestry. Um, the responsible application of, you know, silviculture um, and science-based management. Um, there's a lot of different terms and symbols that have been used in the literature and also in practice um, that really get at a similar approach to management. Um, in my opinion, um, ecological forestry is perhaps best characterized as our approach or effort to better integrate the science of ecology with the art of um, scientific forestry. So trying to better kind of integrate those two, those two disciplines um, in the way that we manage our forests. Um, wildlife forestry, um, while a bit different and a bit more focused on specific life history needs of different kind of focal wildlife species, um, shares a lot of similarities and approaches to this idea of ecological forestry. And so when I think about wildlife forestry, kind of big picture in the context of bottomland hardwoods, um, I think about the role of kind of charismatic conservation focal species um, as being a flagship for promoting ecological forestry. And so a lot of that means implementing uneven age selection silviculture um, in an attempt to mimic natural disturbance patterns in the type of forest ecosystems that we work in, right? Um, it's worth noting as well that our knowledge of disturbance ecology and really forest ecology more broadly in bottomland hardwoods is limited. Um, but, you know, a lot of the evidence suggests that these forests develop over time under certain su um, successional trajectories. Um, into uneven age characteristics, um, promoting more shade tolerant tree species development over time. And Dr. Lockhart is going to get more, a lot more into that um, and the idea of disturbance in ecology during his presentation. But, you know, um, big picture thinking about using some of these uneven age selection silvicultural approaches to increase diversity and resilience of our forests um, and diversity in kind of the broad sense of the word. Um, structure, age class, um, diameter distribution, species diversity. Um, this approach to management really has a lot of benefits for uh, forest interior um, birds that really benefit from more later successional um, habitat conditions. And so essentially we're mimicking natural disturbance to accelerate the successional trajectory of a forest to, pro to promote more later successional conditions for the species that need them. Um, thinking about kind of the humble approach and how little we really do know about the disturbance ecology of bottom lands, I think it's also really important and integral to understand the landscape scale needs of the geography you're working in. Um, and that, you know, often cases uneven age silviculture on its own might not get us there in terms of what the habitat needs are for at risk or declining wildlife populations. And so 
early successional habitat and even age management, um, which, you know, maybe historically was a more infrequent disturbance pattern in some of these systems, certainly has a role to play and certainly has an ecological and silvicultural justification, um, especially for some of these species that need it. Um, so things like patch cuts and shelter wood treatments um, and approaches that really benefit um, that suite of species are, are important as well. Um, and especially where oak is a goal um, or the promotion of more shade intermediate or shade intolerant species. So shifting a little to the socio uh, demographic side of things, um, you know, we know that family forest owners or non-corporate private landowners own the majority of the forest lands in the South, right? About 58% of all of our forest lands are, are in this, um, this land, these landowners' hands. We also know that the majority of those, about 88%, um, don't have a written forest management plan, and many are considered underserved, um, as evident by very low adoption rates of things like government um, cost share programs and tax incentive programs. Um, additionally, um, these family forest owners um, report that their, meet, their reasons for owning forest land are mostly um, associated with non-market values, things like beauty or scenery, biological diversity, um, water resources, and most importantly, um, for the context of this conversation, uh, wildlife habitat. And so this evidence suggests to me that there's a huge opportunity for more strategic outreach to family forest owners in the region um, on wildlife forestry approaches to help meet their goals for their woodlands. And so a lot of our bottomland hardwood program in the South is really focused on exporting um, practices relating to wildlife forestry from the lower Mississippi Valley to the Atlantic coastal plain. So, you know, the lower Mississippi Valley, this large floodplain, uh, a lot of which has been converted to agriculture, has a rich history of um, the science and application of bottomland hardwood silviculture. So a lot of our work is focused on engaging with those partners and leveraging that to achieve more of it, and specifically achieve more of it on family forest land in the lower Mississippi Valley, but also exporting some of those practices that are appropriate to the Atlantic Coastal Plain as well, where in recent years we've seen, we've seen increased management of bottomland hardwoods in the Atlantic Coast, but not always necessarily um, the adoption of um, more sophisticated silvicultural approaches. And so thinking about the differences in markets, thinking about the differences in terms of um, different opportunities for foresters and landowners to implement those things is key. And so on the kind of more project level, um, we're currently working closely with the Nature Conservancy and with the Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries to um, expand wildlife forestry opportunities in the lower Mississippi Valley. And we're working in Arkansas, Mississippi, and Louisiana. Um, like I mentioned previously, we hosted a um, kind of second learning exchange this past fall, um, worked really closely with Duck to do that um, in Baton Rouge, um, and brought together kind of scientists and practitioners from across the region to talk about bottomland hardwood management. Um, we're also planning um, a series of strategic outreach activities to family forest owners in the valley, uh, working closely with the Nature Conservancy on that to utilize um, the Lower Mississippi Valley Joint Ventures um, landowner database to kind of think about targeting some of these larger um, natural bottomland hardwood land ownerships. Hosting a series of workshops to really inspire wildlife forestry practices, um, targeting landowners, and then working with a network of foresters to create um, cost share compliant uh, management plans, and then working with those landowners to implement the practices as well. Um, and also uh, working to create more demonstration sites on state and other public lands. And so this kind of shows our overall kind of focal area. So just the eco region of the lower Mississippi Valley um, clipped into the tri-state um, region that we're working in. And so a similar project um, that we're doing in the Atlantic coast is really um, targeted to the coastal Carolinas. So we're working in the coastal plain of South Carolina and North Carolina to um, do a number of the same things. Uh, one of the um, kind of limiting factors that um, we've come to appreciate is that 
there's really a lack of demonstration sites in the Atlantic coast that showcase what this type of silviculture and this type of management looks like on the ground in bottomland hardwoods and how to pull it off economically and operationally. And so we're really excited to be partnering with the Fish and Wildlife Service and also with um, South Carolina DNR to create some of those demonstration areas for wildlife forestry um, on the public land bases in those states. Um, and then you'll see the other activities are pretty similar to what we're doing in the lower Mississippi Valley, kind of leveraging those demonstration sites to do education and outreach, and then working with a network of foresters to directly prepare plans and um, you know, transition those landowners to implementation of some of the practices. And again, this is our focal area, um, the coastal plain ecoregion, um, and then some of our target um, focal areas for outreach and on the ground activities. And so that's uh, all I have, kind of 10,000 foot view. Um, and so thanks for your time and thanks to all our partners and sponsors um, for these, these projects and activities. And uh, at this point, I'll stop sharing my screen and um, punt to the, uh, to the next presenter. Great. Thanks, Nick. And I think, Brian, if you want to get ready with your presentation next. Uh, thank you, everyone who's joined us into that call. Um, I just ask that while you're here, you have your microphone muted so we can try and avoid background noise so we can listen to our great presenters. Um, up next, we have Dr. Brian Roy Lockhart. Um, he has always been passionate about hardwood silviculture, particularly in bottomland hardwoods. He has been a professor at both the School of Forest Resources at University of Arkansas and the School of Renewable Resources at Louisiana State University. Most recently, he was a research forester for 16 years at the Center for Bottomland Hardwood Research in Stoneville, Mississippi, and we're pretty excited to hear from him today. And if you have any questions that um, occur during this presentation or during the next presentation or any at all, feel free to type them into the chat box on the right and I'll take note of them and be able to ask them for you when we have time for questions at the end of both presentations. Okay, um, can you uh, see it now? Not yet. Okay, what do I need to do? <laughs> All right, can you see the at the bottom the share screen? Yes, got it. Perfect. Do you see it now? Not yet. All right. There we go. I know we went over this, but uh, I'm getting too old. <laughs> there we go, got it? All right, yep. Okay, uh, Kyle, this talk is 18 S's of Bottomland Hardwood Ecology in preparation for civil culture and management. Uh, this is something that uh, I've just kind of been working on over the years, uh, coming up with to try and make it a little easier to, to remember all the aspects of bottom line hardwood ecology. Uh, so the question is, why do we need to understand ecology? Well, ecology in, in forests is a starting point, not just for bottom line hardwood management, but for all forest management. But particularly with bottom line hardwoods, we're working with uh, very complex systems. Uh, terms of inputs and outputs, especially uh, in concerning surface and subsurface flow of water, uh, which is something that makes uh, bottom line hardwood systems unique. And also the very disturbance regimes uh, that uh, Nick was talking about. Uh, we don't have a, a lot of understanding of these disturbance regimes, but also keep in mind that bottom line hardwoods, all bottom line hardwoods are impacted just from the changes in water flow pattern from things such as levees and roads. Uh, so they, they're all currently impacted. And also uh, to keep in mind that, that hardwood silviculture and management is vastly different than pine silviculture and management uh, in large part because we don't have near the knowledge database for bottomland hardwoods. So we still do a lot of seat of the pants art forestry in bottomland hardwoods versus the science in pine where we're trying to grow that extra one cubic foot of wood. Uh, and again, we're dealing with multiple species versus single species. 
So with that as a backdrop, I'll, I'll start you up again to these S's. Uh, the first one, sedimentation. And it's one thing that's very unique about bottomland hardwoods is, is the sediment, the flooding that results in uh, various deposition patterns. And with that, we're talking about the, the sand, silt, and clay particles. In this example here, you can see uh, in, the, in the front here is a, a sand deposit uh, before this was cleared uh, for agriculture. And in the back, you've got more of a, a loamy soil. And in, in the very back where you still have forest, that that's, tends to be heavy clay soil that still floods a lot. So, and in the next slide, you can see that it doesn't take much change in elevation to get these different deposition patterns. As you can see this person, this is the same slide, same spot more or less, you can see the little sand ridge here compared to where he's standing at. So sedimentation, uh, this leads to soils. Uh, these different deposition patterns lead to different textures. So on a major floodplain like the Mississippi River where we tend to have a sand or a uh, mud bar right up against the river, over time as the rivers change courses and move away, uh, you tend to get what I like to call soil succession. In other words, you get hor horizontal development such as the E layer and the B layers with the various sub subtext the B layers and eventually the floodplain will, will move to a lower elevation resulting in the original floodplain becoming more of a terrace that doesn't flood near as often. Uh, and here we get even more horizon development uh, because it's not getting near the inputs it used to. And for major river systems such as the Mississippi River, we also get a change in pH. Uh, in these uh, relatively new soils, our pHs tend to be neutral or even basic. And over time, due to various processes such as acid rain and organic matter decay, the soils be will become more pH and the species tend to reflect that. Uh, this leads to a third S called site. And, and to keep in mind the meandering nature of all rivers and streams, but in particular our larger rivers and how they tend to move over time. Approximately 2000 years ago, uh, based on observing water well borings and stuff. The Arkansas River here used to flow down to the Gulf of Mexico. And there's been times where the Ohio River has flowed down to the Gulf of Mexico and the Mississippi being more of a, a, a sub, sub river to these other rivers. So these change over time, you can tell by differences in soil color uh, as to what river was where over time. But again, this, oops, this tends to lead to uh, in tying in with the previous slide to the active floodplain, which is floods more or less on a regular interval. And then the terraces here, which are just old active floodplains uh, that are not uh, flooded as often. A fourth S is species. In bottomland hardwoods, we are generally dealing with as many as 70 different tree species. And we've measured as many as 20 uh, per acre in, in some of our studies. Uh, the thing about these tree species is we need to have a good civical understanding of, of each of these species in order to manage them. And that includes fruiting, flowering, how the, the seed are dispersed, uh, germination requirements, and important shade and flood tolerances, especially for bottomland species. And also one that's gaining more recognition is growth and development, and in particular competitive relationships, which I'll talk about more in stand development. But it's not just tree species, it's all species. And, and that includes other plants, uh, herbaceous plants that may hold certain nutrients in the spring during flooding and, and make them more available later in the growing season and wildlife. And, and while many are familiar with game species because of hunting, uh, I also really like to point out the, the importance of non-game species. And the example I have here is a yellow-billed cuckoo. As the neotropical migrants are coming in right now, uh, they're very hungry. Uh, they're going to be eating a lot of uh, caterpillars, uh, something to, to recharge their proteins. Uh, these are caterpillars that would be eating a, a lot of leaves if they were still around. So you kind of tie in the idea of how much these birds play in things like timber production. Uh, it'd be interesting to see if somebody can answer that question about how much monetary value these, these birds provide. All these four S's then lead to start starting to integrate uh, these together into species site relationships. And in particular, uh, the bottom graph, bottom chart here shows that uh, the active floodplain in the terrace, you see the ver various micro topographic features of floodplains, uh, whether it be bars, fronts, ridges, flats, sloughs, uh, where as little as just one to three foot change in elevation can completely change your species composition. 
And in this picture here, you can see we have a case of open water, uh, followed by a little bit higher elevation where you have more of herbaceous growth. Uh, this floods every year uh, to an area that floods often, but not as often, which is right here is bald cypress. And in the background here is water oak. And really the change in elevation is just about one foot here in this particular spot, but it completely changes the soils, which uh, changes species composition. And this, this integration of these previous S's into species site relationships are what I like to term are bringing to mind the increases in complexity in bottomland hardwood management. All right, the sixth and the next couple will be similar are seed biology, ecology, and ecophysiology. Um, we just, again, this goes back to some of the civical understandings that, that we must have. But the examples I have here is a, a cherry bark oak twig, and you're going to see a theme about cherry bark oak. Um, in this case, we're looking at acorns that if this was uh, a twig that just fell this week, we would have twigs, uh, acorns here that will fall this fall. But with red oaks, we can also see the acorns for next fall are right here. So you can get more or less a year and a half window to see if you've got a bumper crop of acorns coming and then you can prepare your management and silvicultural practices to try and take advantage of, of a potential bumper seed crop. Although a lot of things can happen in a year and a half to, to kill off that crop. And the other example I have here is a, a flat that uh, flooded and brought in a lot of cottonwood seed uh, this stand here is less than a year old. This is toward the ends of the growing season. And you can see this is pure cottonwood and uh, more or less trying to do a little bit of a, a release operation by going through and bush hogging. The next one is seedling biology, ecology, and ecophysiology. Uh, and this is the one a lot of people are focused in on in terms of regeneration practices to, to try and get these seedlings going. Um, in particular, this example here is a cherry bark oak seedling. If you'll note, there's pine needles around it. Uh, this is in the big back Black River floodplain in Mississippi. Uh, what I wanted to point out here is this was a recently thinned pine stand. And if I can get my cursor here, this is a very unique seedling in that this is a five flush seedling in the wild. Uh, we, we can get growth like this in a greenhouse, but I've never seen a five flush seedling in the wild. This started from an acorn, so you got the first flush, the second flush, the third flush, the fourth flush, and a, the fifth flush. And in particular, in a pine stand, it's not just the quantity of sunlight reaching seedlings, but I also wonder about the quality of sunlight and its impact on, on regeneration. One that, that we don't tend to think about because we're so focused on regeneration and in larger trees is saplings. And this particular graph, you've got uh, sapling uh, growth over time uh, with heights here on the left and residual basal area on the x-axis. And residual basal area would be a, a surrogate for shade. So increasing residual basal area is increasing shade. You note that for all the species, regardless of shade tolerance, their best growth is uh, as saplings is in low residual basal area, even the more shade tolerant species. But what I want to point out here uh, is uh, look at the red oak graph line here. Uh, red oaks do real well in almost full sunlight as saplings. So once we get that, that seedling going and established, then we need to, to start getting more light to it. But you can see it doesn't take much residual basal area to start reducing growth. And in particular, over time, uh, or increasing residual basal area, you can see that red oaks are the most sensitive. Uh, they decline in growth the fastest compared to all these other species, which if you maintain that residual basal area uh, or shade over the, the saplings, uh, all the other species will outgrow them. Uh, sprout biology, ecology, and ecophysiology. Now this is one we really have poor understanding on. Um, uh, you know, just what role do sprouts play in, in the regeneration of our bottomland hardwood forest? Sprouting is, is much better known for upland hardwoods and, and it's a, a very reliable regeneration of upland hardwoods. We're just not as sure with bottomlands. This is a water uh, tupelo stump sprout. And this is a sycamore stump sprout that uh, I believe is in its second growing season. Uh, and I, just as by way of knowledge that, that I've yet to see a, a large sycamore tree not sprout. Usually as a tree gets larger, its propensity to sprout is less, but sycamore seems to uh, be a uh, abnormal, uh, doesn't follow that rule. 
Uh, a tenth one is stand structures. So a question I like to ask folks is, is this stand here, which is in the Roanoke River bottom in North Carolina, is this an even age stand or an uneven age stand? And in this tour we took uh, back in the um, late 1980s, uh, this is actually an even age stand. The forester for the company that was showing us this property has cored this cherry bark oak several times. This tree is only about 50 years old. And, and the intermediate sized trees here are sweet gum and the small stems are ironwood. And, and we'll hear that theme over a few, few more times uh, when we talk about stand development. But uh, this is one of the, the big misnomers that we're starting to change now that uh, this would graph out as a uh, bell shape or a reverse J shaped curve indicating an uneven age stand when in fact it's an even age stand. Uh, also on stand structures, uh, important especially for um, wildlife forestry and also for stand development purposes is vertical and horizontal structures. So in terms of vertical structures, you see stems of uh, different uh, sizes here uh, because wildlife habitat, and, and my favorite is, is the neotropical birds. There are species of birds that'll inhabit the ground, inhabit lower uh, structure, mid intermediate structure, and even the tops of canopies, all different suites of birds. And it's shown here in this slide, you know, even some of the larger trees that provide uh, various kinds of horizontal structures. That again, there might be species here, here, and here, in addition to in the palmetto. So the, these uh, stand structures is a very important aspect of, of bottomland hardwood ecology. The next S is successional pathways. Now, and we're talking both autogenic and allogenic or biotic and abiotic processes, but in large river systems, we typically start out with a black willow or an eastern cottonwood stand on a sandbar or mud flat. Over time, as that site, and you start bringing in these other aspects of S's of bottomland hardwood ecology we've talked about, you start getting various deposition patterns, building the site up to where it won't flood as often, the soil textures, the change in pH. We start getting a different uh, series of species coming in, uh, but eventually the ending point, whether we're starting out with black willow or eastern cottonwood will be oak hickory. Uh, now we're talking anywhere from 600 to 1000 year time frame with this. But again, there are examples within the Batcher land or the land between the levees and the Mississippi River where we have oak hickory forests, but they're on high ridges uh, that if you probably bore down uh, many feet, you might end up finding a sandbar down there. But again, and in minor river systems such as the Saline River in Arkansas where we tend to start out with something like river birch. More or less the same thing happens, just a different suite of species, but we eventually end up with oak hickory. So understanding where you're at in a successional pathway is an important aspect of bottomland hardwood ecology. Uh, the next one is scale type frequency and intensity of disturbance. You'll see uh, these mentioned in various um, uh, orders. I use scale first so I can meet my S requirement as one of the 18 S's. Uh, but we have much to learn. As Nick mentioned, we, we don't have a very good understanding of natural disturbance patterns in bottomland hardwoods and complicate with that with the fact that we're, they're always disturbed in the fact that uh, the flood patterns have changed. Uh, a concept that's gaining popularity out west and this falls in line with ecological forestry is the ENDR. Uh, emulating natural disturbance regimes. And, and that's something that, that uh, is, is being published quite a bit on forests out west, uh, a little bit in the south with longleaf pine, and also up north. Uh, but we really haven't touched that in bottomland hardwoods, in part because we just don't have the knowledge base to do that. But I think it's something that's coming down the road. Uh, the next S is stratified mixture concepts. And this is going back to some of that uh, stand structures. Again, you have this uh, jungle stage. This was a planted stand uh, to water and willow oak uh, in an old field next to the Mississippi River levee on the protected side of the levee. Uh, it's hard to tell that there's planted trees in there because of the invasion of box elder and swamp dogwood that occurred here. In fact, during this stage, when we're walking around in here, those are the dominant species. The oaks are there, but they're just not very prominent. But over time, which I'm going to show in the next couple of slides, that'll change and as the stands stratify and start sorting themselves out to where we end up with, again, a stratified stand here that probably started out as a jungle in the sapling stage, but you have this large cherry bark oak, again, surrounded by um, sweet gum and the smaller stems tend to be ironwood. 
All right, this gets into my most favored S and that's stand development patterns. I, I have a lot of interest in this topic. Uh, a very interesting study uh, done out of the Southern Hardwoods Lab in Stoneville back in the 1950s was uh, looking at uh, more or less some clear cuts um, uh, and then how the, uh, the number of stems over time. Uh, these are stems that had to have at least a DBH before they were measured. But you can see uh, early on in stand development, if I can get my cursor to work, you can see uh, by age nine uh, to 10 that we had a major influx of river, uh, river birch, sweet gum, and ironwood. And notice that the oaks are not near as prominent as these other species in terms of trees per acre, but they're there. And they're kind of hanging around over time. You get to age 37, they're, they're still there. We still have more ironwood and, and sweet gum, but the river birch has really declined. That's a short-lived species. So more or less, uh, if we look at the next graph, which is basal area, we can see that ironwood, even though it was, uh, the, had the highest density uh, of stems per acre, you can see it never con constituted much of the basal area because they were always small stems. But note the river birch uh, here in yellow how it used to have a considerable amount of basal area, but it's almost non-existent by age 37. Uh, basically to get that 20 inch river birch tree in an older mature bottomland hardwood forest, we probably had to start out with a lot, hundreds of stems per acre just to get to that one tree. Uh, note the green, which is sweet gum. Uh, again, it's been prominent. It's been the, the more or less the highest basal area, but that's starting to waver some as the stand gets older as the red oak proportion of basal area in red oak increases. And that's because they're stratifying above these other species now. The crowns are growing bigger, more leaves produce more food, produce more bigger diameters, such that we get a picture like this. Uh, this is a plot in, in that study. And you, this is at age 50. Uh, again, this is a measured plot. You can see the big tree in the center. And I'm just having a lot of problems with my cursor. The big tree in the center is a a water oak. Uh, there's a couple of red oaks here to the left and back in the back here is another red oak. The intermediate trees here are sweet gum and the small stems here are ironwood. Again the classic stratified mixed stand of bottomland hardwoods. Uh, this more or less was a red oak gum stand when it was cut and it came back to a red oak gum stand. Now what we don't know is what uh, what regeneration was present at the time of the cut. Uh, so we don't know if the, if the oak stems were there or did they come in after the cut. Another S is services, and in particular for, for what we're talking about today is wildlife habitat. Uh, also uh, flood attenuation, uh, clean water, but also as part of services, this used to be called functions and values, and they now lump it all under services, but some of the values are also for uh, forest products, timber production, but also education, uh, and here, and this is the bottom land an old growth bottomland sweet gum stand. Both of these trees are sweet gums. And then some of the oak plantings that are occurring in the Delta, which are not doing very well. You can see they're very limmy. Uh, they're not stratifying because there's not other species in there. These are pure red oak stands. So there's a lot of education that, that comes along in, in terms of values of bottomland hardwoods. Uh, another S is sound science. Uh, this is increasingly important. You heard Nick mention it a few times, uh, but we're well behind on the science in bottomland hardwoods. There was a quote from a person about bottomland hardwoods compared to pine that we were about uh, 20 to 30 year bu years behind in the research bottomland hardwoods to pines. Uh, th that quote was done in the 1940s. And I, I think if anything, we're even further behind today. And part of this is due to, there's very little organization in research in bottomland hardwoods. It's more or less people doing individual projects on things they're interested in or things they can get funded. But, but we have a dire need for, for leadership in, in, on the research side to kind of um, share resources and get, uh, get answer some important questions instead of more or less this hodgepodge research approach we have. The next to last S I have is senses. Uh, and one of them is hearing. And how important is hearing to bottomland hardwood management? Well, if you're in your deer stand in, in the fall, so you don't have leaves on the trees and you're not having any luck hunting, if you'll sit there, you can hear competition. As a, if you got a little wind, the crowns are beating each other. And that's extremely important in bottomland hardwood 
uh, stratified mixtures is the competition that occurs between species. An example I use is here, um, uh, this picture here is uh, about a month after Hurricane Katrina uh, in central Mississippi. This is a sweet gum tree. This is a cherry bark oak. This sweet gum tree, when you stand under them and look up, there are almost no leaves on this side of the crown of the tree. And in fact, a lot of the twigs, that year's growth of twigs have been broken off because of this oak tree, which has stouter twigs, has been beating into this tree during those hurricane force winds. You can see the cherry bark oak has lost a few leaves, but not many, and it basically didn't lose any twigs. So as it's beating this gum out and making more room, you get a case like here, and this was in the Lursal Hills in Mississippi. You have the sweet gum tree here, and you have some oak trees here. Notice the sweet gum, how the crown is pushing out to the left here. Uh, basically what is happening is over time as these cherry bark oaks are beating the terminal bud off the sweet gum, lateral buds are taking over and the crown trying to get some sunlight is being pushed out and this creates space here that the, the cherry bark oak or red oaks in general will take over and increase their crown, increase the leaf area, increase their growth. And finally my last S is uh, sources of information. Uh, Nick uh, mentioned a couple of these. But uh, in, in our, our neck of the woods, we have a publication called Management, Management and Inventory of Southern Hardwoods by Putnam, Furnival, and McKnight that was published in 1960 that in many ways is still considered a Bible for management today. Uh, it's in serious need of updating. Uh, I've written a couple of hardwood notebooks, one for Arkansas and one for Mississippi. Uh, in, in the last 15 to 20 years, unfortunately, they have not been very well advertised. And so most people have never heard of them and they're not available online either. Uh, there also is a guide to bottomland hardwood restoration that the Forest Service and I believe NRCS put together. And then we have the, the DFC guidelines, desired forest conditions or wildlife, habit, wildlife forestry guidelines, and then the ecological forestry practices. And these are the two latest um, that are, are focus of a lot of what uh, the Forest Steward Guild is doing today. So with that, that's the uh, 18 S's, uh, a, a slide here on application to silviculture and management. I, I mentioned about the pure oak plantings in the Mississippi uh, Alluvial Valley. Uh, here's a case where a, an experiment was conducted looking at planting of mixtures of species. So we have this cherry bark oak stem here, and it's in a row of mixture of an oak, a gum, then an oak, then a gum, an oak and a gum. On each side of this row is pure rows of sweet gum, such that this individual cherry bark oak is surrounded by eight sweet gum. Well, sweet gum has an excurrent crown form, so as it's growing up, it's not growing out. Now, an oak tree will grow out. Just look at a yard tree in the in, uh, an oak tree in the yard, but here it can't do that. It's forced to go up. This particular stem and this stand here in this picture on the left is age 10. Uh, there's about five feet of height growth on this cherry bark oak. It is established. It's starting to take off. Look at how much room it's got in the overstory to grow. This picture on the right is the same stand, uh, eight by eight spacing of oak and gum. Notice that the cherry bark oak is very straight, no limbs on it, like you saw in that pure oak planting. Uh, the oak is now stratifying above the gum. It's starting to expand its crowns, grow leaves, uh, grow the crown, more leaves, and now we're gonna start seeing more increased diameter growth. And so that's a, an example of application of some of the ecological understanding. This is starting to occur more often in the, in the LMAV to, to get away from those pure oak plantings and, and mix it up with some other species. And with that, I said this was gonna have a theme of some cherry bark oak in it. Uh, for those who don't know, Q pagoda stands for Quercus pagoda, which is a scientific name for cherry bark oak. And I'm, I'm finished. Great, thank you, Brian. Uh, that was great. And if anyone has any questions, um, be sure to type them into the chat box and I'll be able to ask them at the end, both Brian and Duck. Um, but thanks, Brian, if you wanna stop sharing your screen so we can get Duck ready to go. And while that happens, uh, Mr. Duck Lacasio, he received a Bachelor of Science in Forest Management from Louisiana State University and a Master of Science degree in Wildlife Management from Louisiana State University. 
He has managed forest resources on Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries wildlife management areas within the Mississippi Alluvial Valley for the last 23 years, and he currently serves as program manager of the LDWF forestry section, supervising all forest management activities on state-owned wildlife management areas. And he has a presentation today on wildlife forestry practices. Uh, I'm pretty excited for everyone to be able to hear him speak to wildlife forestry. How do I get out of this? <laughs> yeah, you should be able to click at the bottom of the screen and stop the screen share. Well, I thought I, well, I was at the top of the screen. Let me see if I can get out of this. Oh, stop share, there we go. There we go. Great. All right, Duck, we're ready for you. All right, you see it? Yep. Good, good Dakota? Okay. Yep, looks good. Well, uh, thank you Dakota for the introduction. Um, the title of my presentation today is Wildlife Forestry in the Lower Mississippi Alluvial Valley. Um, it's a lot, of, a lot to cover in 25 minutes, so we'll jump right in. Here's some fun facts about the Lower Mississippi Alluvial Valley. Also called, you'll hear me talk about it as MAV or, or LMV. Uh, prior to European uh, settlement, forests occupied approximately 25 million acres. By the mid-1980s, only about 6.6 .6 million acres remained. Over the, you know, since the 80s, we've, uh, we've restored about a million acres. Most of that is WRP property, young, real young hardwood stands. But we're sitting now at 7.6 million acres, which is approximately 30% of the historical, historically forested area. Nick had a picture similar to this. This is a geographical area of the uh, MAV. <clears throat> this is actually showing forest types or forest communities or, or land use. Um, the take home here is the white is basically all agriculture. Um, it's the, the, you know, over 70% of the, of the land area is in rice, beans, cotton, or corn, a little sugar cane down south. Um, the brown is the wooded wetlands. That's the remaining forest. That's the 30% of the MAV that's still forested. This is important because as wildlife managers, we must attempt to provide life history needs for wildlife populations on less than a third of the historic landscape. Now, that landscape, who owns it? Well, um, Nick had discussed uh, as far as in the South, the, um, <clears throat> uh, how much is in private, how much is in public, but in the MAV, 18% uh, is in public. That's primarily state wildlife agencies like mine, Louisiana Department of Wildlife Fisheries, and uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. These stands are primarily mature hardwood stands. Um, they're managed for wildlife habitat because they're owned by state and federal agencies that are that are either mandated they're mandated to uh, to manage for wildlife, and they also have long-term objectives. And uh, they're not going to change hands. These properties aren't going to change hands. 82%, the vast majority of the uh, forested habitat in MAV is in private uh, ownership. These are generally younger hardwood stands, a little bit less attention to wildlife, and uh, short-term objectives, much shorter than you're going to find on public land. <clears throat> so what is wildlife forestry? Nick had that list of things that are kind of similar to wildlife forestry, ecological forestry, uneven age forestry, near to nature forestry. Um, in preparing for this presentation, I did a pretty vast search looking for a definition of wildlife forestry and really didn't find one or didn't find one that I thought fit. So I drafted this one um, that I believe contains all the key points that we'll discuss today. It's basically uh, applying the, percent, the principles of forest ecology and silviculture um, to produce life history needs of wildlife at both landscape and stand level scale while improving timber stand condition providing for forest regeneration and producing forest products in an ever-changing environment. I'll just break it down just, just a little bit. Um, we're applying the principles of forest ecology and silviculture. That's what Brian just finished discussing with the life history needs of wildlife. That's a lot of folks on this call are uh, probably uh, have biological backgrounds. That's that, that's that those life history needs that habitat we know that, that each individual and suites of individuals species need. And we're going to provide this habitat, understanding ecology and forestry of hardwood, bottom and hardwood forestry. Um, while when we make an entry, an entry, 
Um, we're going to improve the timber stand conditions. We always want to make the conditions better than it was when we when when we when we first moved in, or you know, moved in with some type of forestry practice. And when I say moved in, I mean move logging equipment into the woods. You want to improve that stand condition so that the next time you enter it, it'll be in a little bit better condition. Maybe you'll have a um, little bit uh, more valuable products to sell. Therefore, you can enter more uh, sooner to provide additional um, wildlife habitat. Always providing for forest uh, re regeneration and producing forest products in an ever-changing environment. And that's kind of a key, especially when we're talking about the Mississippi Lou Valley, that ever-changing environment. Because the MAV is far from a static system, and managers must constantly adapt to um, unpredictable flooding, unpredictable droughts. Um, here, the last several springs and summers, we've had high water that stays up late into the spring, into early summer. That that has a lot of uh, we have a lot of issues with uh, you know browse and cover. We're trying to produce as far from a wildlife had standpoint, but also regenerate regenerating those forests. We we oftentimes lose our, our regeneration. Um, and uh, starting to lose on, on some properties, uh, especially in the lower portion of the MAV, um, due to the river, Mississippi River flooding up into the summer, we're starting to lose uh, overstory, uh, you know, mature timber, 80, 100 year old um, stems. Um, and then we always have to be mindful of this ever changing environment that, that you have these short term, kind of yearly things that happen, droughts and floods, but, but, um, in the area where, where I do a lot of work in the southern part of the MAV in Louisiana, uh, we our our whole plant communities are starting to change. And um, what was a a uh, uh, basically uh, losing track of thought for a second. Anyway, these forest communities were once. Um, I try to go back to it. I'm sorry. <laughs> anyway. Key point is, is ever-changing environment, and we need to be cognizant of that as we make these decisions, um, wildlife forestry. But uh, the process is all the same. Whether you're dealing with a large WMA or a large refuge or, or, or just a private landowner a, a track, it's all, you can dumb it down and, and simplify it by following this process. We first start with a general evaluation, both from the stand level to the landscape level, just generally, what, what forest types make up um, that property? What plant communities make up that property? And generally what condition they're in. This allows us to compartmentalize and develop an entry schedule. We're gonna go ahead and, and break these stands in these, this larger property into, into stands or compartments and then enter the compartments on a schedule to evaluate the timber and the habitat conditions at the compartment level. That's when we're gonna go ahead and do a, an active timber cruise um, also look at look at each when we enter each compartment. Look at the habitat requirements and life history needs of the species that we're managing for on that property. And that's based on the objectives of either the WMA or refuge or landowner. If you're talking about a private property, and then we go ahead and then we choose the methods which to reach the objectives. The rest of this presentation is basically going to cover objectives and methods. But before that, we, we need to discuss just a few wildlife forestry key points. And that is that forest dependent wildlife is responsive to habitat conditions at multiple scales, both at the landscape quality and site quality scale. Not all species require similar habitat. I know it's pretty simple, but um, thing to think of, but, but it's even more so sometimes individual species require two different habitats. If you think about American woodcock, they're, the difference between nocturnal habitat and diurnal habitat for woodcock are, or 180 degrees. So not all species and even individual species need various types of habitat. Because of that, there's no several bullet habitat treatment. There's not one prescription we can write to provide wildlife habitat in the Mississippi Lua Valley because it all depends on what wildlife species you, you're starting with, or you're managing for, the initial stand conditions, what you're starting with, the conditions of the surrounding landscape, and then also you know recreational opportunities. Um, that's a driving factor on state and federal properties because they are, um, you know, recreational pursuits is what kind of um, drives those, those properties. And also in private land settings, most of the MAV is, uh, is, is made up of private landowners who have it as hunting clubs or, um, or, or they're recreating in other ways, not just hunting, fishing, bird washing. And then lastly, future civicultural options 
are influenced by long-term sustainability. Must always um, keep that in the back of my mind, our mind that we're managing for sustainability long-term. It allows us to get back in there and provide that wildlife habitat that we're, that we're, we're trying to see. So let's talk about objectives. I had, I had developed this slide. Um, the audience at that time was, was you know, WMA and refuge personnel. But uh, this is applicable to many private properties also, where the primary objective is wildlife habitat enhancement. Um, also, the objective is to create or enhance habitat conditions to meet the ecological needs of wildlife. We try to provide vertical and horizontal structural diversity in terms of tree species, size, age class, and growth forms with a heterogeneous canopy comprised of gaps and complex layering. Try to provide quality wildlife oriented recreational opportunities for the public or for the landowner. And maintain a sustainable yield of forest products to provide a cost effective means by which we can provide desired forest conditions for wildlife and enhance that through commercial timber harvesting. Now the method we'll discuss here on out is timber harvesting. That's the method that we're going to use or that we, we generally use in the MAV to, uh, to reach those objectives of uh, wildlife habitat. It's the most cost effective means of manipulating the forest structure to enhance and maintain, develop, prescribe wildlife habitat conditions. A key point is though, we use wildlife habitat as managed with timber harvesting, not as a result of timber management, which you know, in the past is so often the case. So now we're gonna get into the methods section. I'm gonna go over five methods. I'm gonna apologize in advance that I'm not, probably won't use the civicultural terms by definition, by textbook definition. But if you think of these as the five tools in the toolbox, these are the methods we will use, depending on what you start, what species you're managing for, wildlife species, and also depending on what condition the forest is in, at the time of entry. Individual tree selection, that's often used when, when you have a well-stocked, relatively uniformly distributed stand. If it's good quality, multiple species, relatively young stand, then you can think of it as a general crown thinning. If the quality is poor, the species diversity is low, and older stands especially, then we generally thin heavier to establish or to advance regeneration, if regeneration is present. Here's a picture that, that a lot of the Mississippi Louisville Valley looks like. There's a closed canopy, dark forest, um, very little light reaching the, reaching the uh, ground, so you have no understory, not too much midstory. But it's uniform, it's uniformly stopped. Um, perfect opportunity to prescribe inventory selection. Before I get to that though, what habitat is this good for, right? So, so we don't want, we're not, we're not just, um, going to do timber treatments to provide wildlife habitat when you know what wildlife habitat we're trying to manage for and what which, which species um, need different types of habitat. This is great habitat for red-eyed vireos, for personitary warblers, Acadian flycatchers. However, it's limited habitat for Swainson's warbler, Kentucky warblers, and hooded warblers. Um, same could be said for it's, it's, you know, marginal habitat for wild turkey, good place for them to display, horrible habitat for, for white-tailed deer. There's very little deer browse except it'd probably be some pretty good habitat um, right after the mass hits the ground in the fall where it's providing, a, a, you know, a, a carbohydrates, late winter carbohydrates for white-tailed deer. So I say all that to, to say that there's no bad habitat, just always different. But to answer the question, is this good or bad wildlife habitat? Well, it depends. But if we want to manage for, if we're managing for species like Kentucky Walbur, Swainson's hoods, then it's time to do some type of treatment. It's got a, it's closed canopy, nothing but dead leaves on the ground. Individual trees are marked for removal. Generally, the poor qualities are marked. Better quality stems are, are retained. Always keep in mind to retain those species, those off species or species that you don't have many, many of so that you can increase that species diversity. After the harvest is about two years post harvest, now you have light hitting the forest floor. You have lush vegetation. In this case, it's mostly Virginia creeper. And I happened to be back in this stand two years post harvest, walking through it kind of to evaluate it. It was in the springtime, late spring. Came across a clutch of wild turkey eggs. Now, I don't know if it was successful because I didn't go back and check. But 
I know this, had that hen nested three years prior before this treatment, you know, coons or possums or something would have come by and, and, and devoured her eggs by then. Another shot of individual selection, just showing that the stand may be uniform, but we don't necessarily uniformly mark it or thin it. Um, we kind of let the forest dictate how hard we're going to hit it. If there's regeneration present, it might be thinning a little heavier. And if it just needs a general crown thinning, then, um, then that's what's prescribed. But in this picture, you can see up in the canopy um, where it's a you know, crown thinning in places, a little heavier in places. Maybe they're off to the left of the screen. It didn't hit, hit so hard. And this is a similar stand. Not sure, uh, it's not the same stand, but similar stand. Just showing that variable retention it's individual tree selection, individual trees were marked, um, and we're making those determinations at the tree level, but, um, but kind of variable, variable intensity, varying that intensity across, uh, across the track, so across the stand. So you can see where you have a lot of vegetative response because there's a lot of sunlight hitting the ground in the foreground. There to the right, a little bit more shade, a little cleaner. They're off in a distance, same, same way. Then we move on to individual tree selection and group selection. Harvest this is kind of the bread and butter. This is used for areas of good quality stocking or poor quality stocking. You thin where it's good and then you group release where it's poor, where the stocking's poor. Generally in those poor stocked areas, light will be hitting the ground. Regeneration will normally be present and you can re release it with groups. It's also used when overstory is manageable yet desirable regeneration is fading. We opportunistically release regeneration with groups and thin in between. And then when the overstory species diversity is low, and regeneration is more diverse, we can thin to increase diversity by, uh, by retaining those off-site species or the species we don't have many of in, in, in that plant community, and then release and regeneration when appropriate. And here's some shots of individual and group selection harvest. You're kind of standing in a group in this picture. There's is individually, individually selected um, between there and the next group in the background. And this is a shot from the air just to kind of get a get a feel for what it looks like. Um, that's a, and a lot of times these groups will follow where the regeneration is present, where the marker, the timber marker practitioner is finding regeneration. Um, it's kind of a large group right in the center and two smaller groups as you move north uh, up the picture and, in, and, it's, and it's thin throughout on both sides. So this is just kind of individual tree selection, group selection. It makes some fantastic habitat because of the diversity. It provides habitat at a wide variety of wild, for a wide variety of wildlife species due to the structural to, uh, diversity that's, that's produced. This is, this is three or four years, yeah, maybe three years post-harvest on a similar stand um, where you can see that you're kind of standing in the, you're in a lot of vegetation and, um, and, then, and then kind of a group in the background and in between, it was, it was uh, thinned in between. Really good um, habitat. Then there's just pure group selection. That's used when, when uh, Habitat and stand conditions are generally good and you don't really want to thin across an entire stand. Can provide patches of early sessional habitat or used to release patches of desirable regeneration. There's a shot of uh, that, that system actually being used where uh, regeneration was located and all the trees uh, within that group are being removed that regeneration is be released. From a wildlife standpoint, this makes excellent wild turkey habitat. These groups, um, provide nesting habitat and then just adjacent in the in the area immediately adjacent that's not thin because we're just using group selection harvest here um, is is uh, some really quality brood rearing habitat because you get this diffuse side light coming through so it's not a clean forest but it's a, a low vegetation forest adjacent to these groups and shot from above just showing the the, the canopy gap and um, and if they're large enough uh, you, you know, you, you can move red oak on, on up through these. Um, there's, there's a little bit of ash and a little bit of oak in this group. Um, and then, you know, 10, 15 years down the road, 12, whatever, when, when you check this post-harvest, you can increase the group size. So if the groups weren't large enough to, to move those, that advanced regeneration up, you've advanced it, and then you can enlarge this group and move that advanced regeneration from saplings up into tree size. The last two I'll talk about are more when, when it's time to regenerate a stand, and that's a shelter wood, which is in a, cl in a classic case is used to advance regeneration for its eventual full release. In the case, we mostly use it 
is kind of a modified case where we're releasing regeneration that's already present or competitive. And the overwood may be retained indefinitely. Most of the time, we, we keep those shelter trees. In doing that, we end up with a two-layer canopy, which is structurally, you know, we, 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 we retain that structural diversity, and we have emergent trees on the, on the, on, within that, that uh, treatment area. And we're able to retain desirable habitat components such as snags, cavities, mass producers. Here's a shot of a shelter wood right after harvest. This is um, kind of a sugarberry dominated with some nut all um, and green ash, but it was very poor quality. But there was a good diversity of, of uh, regeneration. And there's some willow to the north. There was actually some willow, re willow oak regeneration, um, along with nut all, uh, American elm, green ash. So we prescribed the shelter wood where we, re where we uh, you know, you can think of a shelter wood as a really, really heavy thinning. Here's a shot on the ground where you can kind of see. This is not the same stand, but it's a willow oak stand and, um, that was shelter wooded. And in these shelter wood stands, the wildlife species, you know, we're doing it for the civic cultural reasons we're doing it, but from the wildlife habitat reasons that is being done, you know, two to five years post harvest of a shelter wood, that makes them really primo, yellow breasted chat, indigo bunny, painted bunny, common yellow throat, those early successional species. Then five to 10 years post-harvest, after that, that regeneration, this relief starts to move up in size, uh, you start, it starts providing habitat for Swainson's warblers, Kentucky warblers, hooded warblers. First year or two after this type of treatment makes some really good nocturnal woodcock habitat. And then, you know, it, when it starts moving into that sapling stage for the next three to seven years, it makes really good diurnal woodcock. And then the last tool in the toolbox is clear cutting, which is another regenera regeneration method. Um, it's to release advanced regeneration under a very low quality overstory. It can also be used in a species conversion, often in conjunction with artificial regeneration. And these, these examples is just that. So this is a species conversion. This is uh, in, in the lower Mississippi Luva Valley. It's um, pure sugarberry. It's a stand that's basically all shade intolerant species, closed canopy, pure sugarberry, really poor quality. Um, another example of this, a little bit further up in the Delta, in the Mississippi, uh, Luvian Valley, up in the Mississippi Delta that I've seen, is these, similar, these same stands that have a lot of ice damage and therefore get a lot of rot coming down the tree. And uh, so real poor overstory, um, no regeneration, no understory, very little midstory. It's poor wildlife habitat, and the timber quality is very poor. That's when it's time to go ahead and clear cut artificial regeneration. And in that case, that's, that's exactly what we did here. This was, um, this was planted, this was harvested and then planted back with uh, not all willow oak, American elm and red maple, mainly about four or five other species, diverse species. And then it's no surprise that after you do that, you get this lush habitat initially, which provides deer browns, provides soft mass, escape cover. And then over time, it starts becoming really excellent habitat for Swainson's Wobblers, American Woodcock, escape cover for deer um, on, on public property and private property. This provides great areas for deer to start getting some age on them um, when you start talking about quality deer management. But it's no surprise that ultimately it becomes a young closed system providing limited habitat for some time. Um, as long as this type of habitat doesn't dominate the landscape, some of this is good. Um, it contributes to the landscape diversity. As you can see in this picture, the red oak is there. And this, this picture reminds me a lot of the one that um, Brian had showed you earlier with the, um, with the swamp dogwood and red oak. But the red oak is there. And over time, it's going to uh, pull through. And, and, and these younger stems are actually training it up. Um, that's the civicultural side of things. But from the wildlife habitat side, this, this is decent habitat for, you know, Acadian flycatchers and, and those dark forest type um, birds that need that closed canopy forest. But for the most part, for the disturbance dependent species that we deal with, this is more of the habitat that they're looking for. So this is going to be my last slide. And this is kind of the end game, that complex layering of um, multi-species forest that provides all the habitat niches for the vast variety of uh, wildlife species that we manage for um, in the MAV. And that kind of ends it. And then we're open to questions for either my presentation or, or Brian's or Nick's. 
Yeah, thank you so much, Duck. That was a great presentation and Brian also a great presentation. Um, if people have any questions, please feel free to type them into the chat box. Um, we did get one from Henry a little bit ago um, about how to reforest clear cut, a clear cut uh, using wildlife forestry practices. And I know Duck, you just spoke to that, but maybe a couple other examples of like uh, tree species or wildlife species you really wanna look for. Yeah, in reforesting a clear cut, so in speaking of the MAV, and it doesn't matter if you're in the MAV or not, when it's time to reforest it, as far as if wildlife is your intention, you're going to reforest it with, site, with, with the species that are specific for that site. Um, you know, if it's a heavy clay soil, um, lower ground, frequent flooding, it's going to be overcut and bitter pecan and, 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 and that group of species, that plant community. If it's a little higher, then it's going to be water oak and willow oak and, and, and so on. So it's, it's all about matching, putting the right species on the right soil type, right elevations, right place in the Mississippi Valley, and then turning it loose. Um, that's, you know, if, if, and there's reasons to clear cut, but if it's time to, to reforest a clear cut, then that's what I would do. It would be, I'd bring in, provided there isn't natural regeneration present. Um, oftentimes there is on, on private landowner, if it, or if, if you end up with a clear cut, that's what was prescribed, there may be natural regeneration present. And if so, there's no need to plan anything. I guess, um, you know, there's the two examples. The example I ended my presentation with, which is a is a is a total species shift. And then if um, if your natural regeneration is present, then then you just let Mother Nature take its course because Mother Nature is generally putting the species that will survive on that site there for a reason. Great, thanks, Duck. Um, next question from Robert. Uh, really wondering about why there is no mention of using crop tree management for wildlife management? So I guess he's talking about using more of a seed tree harvest um, or crop tree management to some degree. And that's why I said I apologize that I wasn't going to use a textbook definitions for those tools. Um, you know, crop tree or seed tree techniques could be could fit right in between shelterwood and clear cut on my on on that list that I had. Oftentimes, um, we do use shelterwood or that modifies shelterwood type system, or what we what we call it. You know, uh, uh, leaving a low residual volume of uh, of leaf trees on a stand, um, you are gonna gain regeneration from those. We we generally do not use crop trees, um, we'd like to see some regeneration, use thinning practices, you know, light thinnings, heavy thinnings to get some hardwood re regeneration before we remove that much, much basal area. Um, so we don't generally go to a seed tree site system. However, it, it can be used and in, 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 uh, Brian, you might add to that. Yeah, a duck in <clears throat> the crop tree management system is, is been developed mainly for upland hardwoods. It's it's actually not a regeneration uh, type uh, treatment. It's uh, more or less uh, you you select your desired crop trees. It's it's definitely a timber production, uh, quality timber production practice, uh, where you find your crop trees at a relatively young age, and you uh, maybe thin a tree or two around them to to keep promoting that individual tree. Um, it um it's as far as i know it's not really practiced in bottomland hardwoods it's another case of upland hardwood management and research is, is just that much further ahead than bottomlands um we, in part because in bottomlands we like to have a lot of species not just for the, the the sake of diversity or for the sake of wildlife habitat but also to improve timber production by pushing as you said training those trees uh, in bottomlands, because in in bottomlands, our competition usually is um, that limits growth. It's not so much from the other trees or below ground. It's it's for light in the overstory. Uh, outside of occasional drought, we typically do not have much in the way of uh, underground water competition. These are bottomlands. Uh, the water table is fairly close most of the year. I think it's another reason why crop tree management has not really been practiced in bottomland hardwoods. Um, that and it's an intensive practice. Um, 
it, it takes uh, a lot of time, uh, expense to go through and evaluate individual trees uh, just to see what you're going to take away from around those trees to improve their development. Uh, so it, at least that's my understanding of crop tree management. Yeah, and it looks like we had a follow-up question from Amanda. I'm just going to read it. Uh, it sounded like the shelter wood with retention keeps some super canopy trees for wildlife. Duck, could you describe some species that would use this type of forest structure? The aerial photos are great for sharing the bird's eye view of managed bottomland hardwood stands. Yeah, those, those emergent trees, so the classic is cerulean warblers. They do their courtship. The male does his courtship song from, from, from the, the tallest trees in a forest. Um, that's why there's, a, there's, that's one importance of those super emergent trees. Also, swallowtail kites. Um, they're, they're really graceful on the wing, but they're, they, they crash land uh, into trees. So for nest availability for swallowtail kites, they're going to use those tallest trees in the canopy. That's why in those shelterwood systems that, that we often use, we retain it. We, we won't use the classic shelterwood and, and take the overwood off um, after we've moved that regeneration up. As long as we've decreased that base layer low enough, that we feel that there's enough sunlight still hitting that regeneration and moving it up, we're gonna leave that overwood there for those reasons. Swallowtail nesting habitat, cerulean warbler habitat. But um, also, you know, um, a lot of times those trees, we try to choose the best stems for longevity, but we also um, are gonna retain some cavity trees, large cavity trees. You know, I start thinking about cottonwood, at least in where I'm at, it's, 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 uh, it's not, long lived like oak and uh, you start getting some pretty nice sized cavities in cottonwood provide some really good um, wood duck cavities um, becomes future black bear cavities the really large stuff so those are all some of the wildlife species are going to use those those uh, those leaf trees in a shelter wood system great thanks duck and we have one more follow-up shelter wood question um, from Walter so when applying a shelter wood cut in bottom lands, how susceptible are the remaining trees to wind throw from thunderstorms and other things? Saying the picture looks pretty thin, um, would you leave more trees to provide more of a wind barrier to the desirable trees or what would you do? Yeah, so we've done, we've done modified, that modified shelter wood, you know, leaving anywhere on the low side, 10 or 12 trees per acre up to maybe 20 trees per acre. And we've tried a little bit of everything. Um, all up and down the Mississippi Luva Valley. For the most part, we're choosing the co-dominant and dominant trees. They, got, they have a pretty good root system. They're not as susceptible to wind throw as you would think. Um, you do lose them over time, one at a time, over time, which is not a bad thing. It just, I, it's, it's, I was just in a stand not that long ago where we did this same type of harvest, but, it, but we, the harvest was 20 15, 20 years ago. And the cool thing is we are losing that overwood over time to wind throw, but just one here, one there. And it's providing coarse woody debris on the ground. Um, and, and also that the regeneration that we release is now sapling size and large saplings, almost pole size. And now as we lose that overwood, now granted, this is, it's lost. It doesn't go to a mill, you know, a private landowner might not be able to swallow that, but on, on, state wildlife management area where wildlife is the key. That's, that's our game. Um, losing those large trees over time, you know, they crash through that pole size, that stand that's underneath it, which, which increases diversity and puts a little light on the ground and starts to release some of those trees. Um, so it's not that great of concern. You don't lose that many. You do lose individuals over time as long as those that you choose are, are good quality trees you know, co-dominant or dominant trees. Great, thanks, Duck. Uh, we have another question from Jean um, about emerald ash borer, and it's how are or will you deal with the EAB in your forest management? I'll answer quickly for Lizzie and Paul on fisheries, and then I'll let Brian talk about it because he's a lot closer to it. We, we just have a little bit in North Louisiana um, 
only one of our WMAs has any emmerash bore. I mean, right now on a timber sale, I will remove green ash as I find it, um, knowing that we're probably going to lose the larger green ash over time as it emmerash bore moves south. However, we've, we've made no plans to go capture all the green ash on our properties. Green ash in the bottom of heart, in, in, in our systems, and most of what we have is kind of mid-aged, mid-secessional um, hardwood. It's scattered. Um, you will find it along the river in some pure stands, but mostly our green ash is pretty scattered. It'd be hard to go capture that green ash volume if we wanted to. So right now, a timber prescription, we're out there marking timber in a compartment. We come across green ash. We're more likely to cut it and put it on a truck than to leave it. But uh, besides that, we're not doing anything um, uh, to try to capture that volume. But Brian, you might add a little bit more about emerald ash borer because that's in your neck of the woods. Yeah, I uh, neck of the woods. I've I've actually moved up to closer to the Ozarks now. But uh, <laughs> I used to live down in in the in the Delta. Uh, the main thing I can say to that was uh, daily watching uh, log trucks full of large ash logs. People were liquidating it in anticipation of the bore. Uh, we we like Doug said we haven't had it that that prominent in the Delta yet. But ash green ash is one of our highest value timber species. So, so that's going to actually hurt quite a bit when it does come through. Um, uh, but, you know, it, it is what it is. There's really not much you can do about it. Um, other than, you know, if you if you've got the ash and, and, and you can go ahead and profit from it now, I'll take it. But again, with wildlife forestry, losing a few ash trees is not that bad. It, it provides more structure. Um, of course, woody debris components but again, you know, people that, that have a lot of large ash, uh, we've been seeing uh, a lot of log trucks with ash go by on the highway. Great. Thanks, you both. Um, so we're getting close to the top of the hour and uh, time for maybe one more question. But if folks need to leave and have other things they need to do, there will be a recording of this webinar and questions um, made available to you all. And just a reminder that attending this webinar does earn you one CFE credit and the registration and participation list will be used for that. Um, and so the recording will also be available. But I think we have time for one more question and that is, um, with saltwater intrusion or flooding in general and change of the environmental um, climate, how can we plan and be proactive to better prescribe management to a new changing species composition? So if I knew that answer, I'd run my wildlife agency. Um, we just have to be proactive. Um, in Louisiana, especially, we, we actually see, we have saltwater intrusion happening regularly, subsidence. Um, based on the, the ecology and civicultural know-how, knowledge that we have of the species that we deal with, we try to anticipate which way that plant community is, is moving and manage for that. That's, that's a quick and easy answer is, is um, in, you kind of, in these systems where, that are, that are changing really rapidly, and, and, it, and it especially is on the very southern end of the MAV, the wildlife habitat is happening, oh, Mother Nature's causing it. It's, we're ending up with early sessional habitat um, because we're losing it to saltwater intrusion or, or subsidence. But it's, as managers, it's, it's anticipating what that next plant community is gonna be so that we don't have to wait. Mother Nature will do it on her own, if we have, you know, 80, 100 years, 200 years, 500 years, who knows? But, um, but as land managers, wildlife agency, like I work for, we need to anticipate what that plant community is going to be and uh, to move the needle quicker, to move, move quicker to that, to that next um, uh, community that we can manage for wildlife. Great. Thank you, Duck. And thanks again, everyone, for joining us today. Um, like I said before, if you missed it or had to jump in and out of this webinar, it will be made available for folks um, and I'll get that information to y'all as soon as it's ready. So thank you everyone for joining us today.